Good afternoon. My name is Steve Duran with Jefferson County, and I'm the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order this meeting on July 25th, 2022, uh, Dr. Cog TAC meeting. In this digital meeting format, members and alternates have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask those intending to speak to use the raise hand button and ask a question or comment on the agenda item. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct them to staff in the Q&A box. But first, at this time, we will do roll call. Cam will list the attendees. And if for some reason you don't hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added to the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance right now, uh, I see uh, Steve Durian, Art Griffith, Brooke Svoboda, Bryce Hammerton, Aaron Busto, Chris Hudson, David Gaspers, David Sabados, Deborah Basket, Elizabeth Relford, Frank Bruno, uh, Frank Gray, Jean Sanson, Justin Schmitz, Kevin Ash, Mac Callison, Phil Greenwald, Rachel Holtine, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, and Wally Wirt. Those are all the members I see at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Cam. Uh, Jacob, I believe we have a couple of new members to, uh, to introduce. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, want to welcome and say congratulations to George Hol Holikov of Denver International Airport, who has been the aviation special interest seat alternate, but is the new member. So congratulations to George. Um, and then we have a change in representation from RAC, the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, David Sabados, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, is the new representative with Wayne Chung. And again, I hope I pronounced correctly as the new alternate. So welcome to our, our new members and alternates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Jacob. All right, next up is public comment. We will now open the meeting to public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will have, uh, then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which time we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. Cam, do you see anyone on your end that's uh, requesting to speak? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second, but I currently do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay, we will then close public comment. Next, we'll... Um, review the January 27th, 2022 TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about either, I'm sorry, uh, uh, about this TAC meeting summary? Please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question, correction, or would like to speak. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, well, we will call the meeting summary approved then. Next up is our first action item, item number four on your agenda, which is the FY 2022 F through FY 2023 Unified Planning Work Program Amendments. Josh Schwenk, you're up for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just as a reminder, our Unified Planning Work Program uh, essentially serves as the work program for Dr. Cog's function as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. So all of the transportation planning activities uh, that we conduct are listed out within this document. Our current UPWP covers uh, two years, 2022 and 23, and was adopted last July, and then uh, amended again uh, this past February. So we regularly put this document out to staff to review and update just to ensure that it remains accurate um, and up to date based on the uh, actual current activities that staff are undergoing. So that's really uh, one of the main impetuses for bringing this before you today. Um, several of the changes are fairly minor, um, updates to uh, language, clarifications, things like that. Um, but there are a couple um, more key changes that I'll run through quickly for you. Uh, the first would be to the regional transportation plan section. 
Um, just an update to actually kind of spell out the greenhouse gas amendment process that we're currently undergoing. That is a, a large amount of staff time and resources that are devoted to that. So we wanted to ensure that that was explicitly listed in the document, um, as well as uh, the change to our transportation improvement program process that we're currently going through. Um, as you all are aware, that's uh, we're currently going through four calls for projects rather than our regular two. So we just wanted to clarify the language around that to ensure that that was accounted for in the document as well. There are a couple other additions to um, tasks and deliverables that are listed in the document, um, including an, an update to the equity analysis that both the RTP and TIP undergo to ensure that investments are um, equitably distributed around our region. That process is being updated to ensure that it is um, accurate and meaningful for staff. Um, so we wanted to ensure that that uh, staff work is included as well as um, an update to our transportation planning in the Denver region document, uh, which really is a good overview of all of the work that we conduct and all of our uh, relationships and coordination with our partner agencies around the region. Um, the other uh, key item that I wanted to touch on uh, for you is the addendum that was sent out to all of you uh, this past Friday uh, to tables one and two, which is the funding information in the back of the document. Uh, we apologize for the, the late notice on this, but we did receive word from CDOT that some of the funding information that we have been provided uh, was inaccurate. There was a miscalculation there. So that has been fixed in the information provided in the addendum. Um, they've removed $1.5 million, which is a uh, Dr. Cog contribution to CDOT for the statewide travel survey. Um, and they've also corrected carryover balances. So um, the new information that you see here on your screen, um, this is a, a bit reduced revenues from what we had initially anticipated, but based on um, kind of our calculations in table two, we do still anticipate there being enough funding uh, to cover all of those activities as originally listed in the document. So we don't anticipate any changes to tasks or deliverables based on the changed funding amount. Um, so with that, happy to take any questions. Uh, there is a proposed motion available here for you on your screen as well as in your packet. Um, I'm happy for any questions or comments that the committee may have. All right, thanks, Josh. Are there any questions? Matt Callison. Thank you, Steve, appreciate that. Um, uh, Josh, are, you indicate that there's no uh, change in the actual, in, in performance of the tasks. Is there any change in the scope of the tasks? Um, no, so um, as originally um, anticipated, we, we expected um, a, a significant uh, amount of um, unused uh, rollover funding at the uh, end of the two-year period, which would apply towards the next um, unified planning work program, uh, that amount has been reduced to account for the reduced revenues that are now projected, but the actual uh, tasks and deliverables we do expect to be able to complete in their entirety as they are listed. Okay, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Steve. All right, are there any, uh, are there any other questions out there? Deborah Basket. Questions. I will make the motion move to recommend to the RTC the amendments to the fiscal year 2022 23 unified planning work program. All right. Frank, uh, so you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Frank. Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, could I ask the maker of the motion and the seconder of the motion to accept a friendly amendment to reference the revised tables uh, in the oh. packet that was sent out? I'm sorry, Deborah. Indeed. Uh, sure, accepted. Indeed. All right, we have a motion. We've got a second. Is there any more discussion? Frank, your hand is still raised. I don't know if you just didn't lower it or you've got another comment or question. Nope, I just didn't get it down there. Okay, no problem. Yep, sorry about that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we have no more questions. So um, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 
And all those opposed, please signify by saying no. And all right, the motion carries. We'll move on to our first informational item on the agenda. It's item number five, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Analysis Mitigation Measures Update. Jacob Rigger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me just a second to get the slides up. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully folks should be seeing that in presentation mode. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Believe it or not, we are actually getting near the end of the technical update process. Um, but as we do every month, we wanna give you an update of kind of where we're at. Um, and we also wanna focus um, this meeting as well on kind of the sort of public review process um, and the final adoption process. So um, just a second here. Um, so first, just kind of a reminder, this I think is a new graphic to you, but the concepts here are most certainly not new. This is what we've been discussing uh, the last six months or so. Really, the, the point here of this graphic illustration is just kind of the major theme that we've talked about is that it really is going to take a framework of multiple strategies um, to get us there to meet the GHG rules reduction levels. Um, the six things that you see bulleted here are the technical components um, that we've been working on as staff and that we've been discussing with you um, in your monthly updates again for the past several months. So there's nothing new here, but really just kind of wanted you to see that visually um, along with the notion we've, we've been talking about the mitigation action plan, uh, the proposed mitigation action plan. We'll talk a little bit more about it today. And as illustrated in the graphic, kind of that bottom thing, that last thing, because that's really what the mitigation action plan represents is kind of that that, um, you know, last sort of, you know, strategy, that last quiver um, in the arrow, so to speak, um, to help us meet the, um, the emission reduction targets in the rule. So speaking of the mitigation action plan, a little bit of review, but just sort of the, the timely reminder, um, as I said, it is needed as that last step to close the remaining reduction level gap. It documents the region's approach to using mitigation measures. Um, again, is very much a regional sort of focused um, analysis because the rule is regional and the and the reduction level uh, requirements are regional. Um, it would report and analyze measures again at the regional level. I think you're detecting a theme here, um, but again, that's the point um, that we're looking at this from a regional perspective, understanding the variability within within individual jurisdictions. Um, implementation anticipated in small fraction of the region in strategic and applicable geographies. So we spent some time on this at the last TAC meeting. I believe I showed you the interactive map that we had put together for our board. Um, but the notion is that we did define some conceptual geographies for analysis purpose purposes. Um, not that the implementation is constrained to those geographies, but just as a reasonable mechanism um, that we could estimate sort of the potential of particular uh, mitigation measures um, and the reduction, potential reduction levels associated with them. Um, an ample opportunity to implement successfully over time to help achieve compliance. Um, another major theme that we've talked about is that this work, and of course, transportation planning in general is a snapshot in time. We will have the requirement to report annually to the Transportation Commission on the Mitigation Action Plan progress of implementation. So that gives us a chance, you know, over the next two to four years or so to adjust our strategies, to adjust our mitigation measures over time um, as we start working with jurisdictions and as we start seeing, you know, how it goes in terms of implementation. So um, this process is flexible, flexible. and adaptable. Um, from that local level perspective, you know, for those of you in local jurisdictions, wanted to talk about it from your perspective a little bit. Um, first, I've said this before, but it, it bears emphasizing mitigation measures and the mitigation action plan are entirely voluntary. There is nothing regulatory, there's nothing directive um, in this portion of the rule or, or in this piece of work. Um, this is a voluntary process that we would be entering not required to implement in any specific location, as I already touched on, the geography was a mechanism for analysis purposes, um, but these mitigation measures and the mitigation action plan are meant to be flexible um, and adaptable. Um, you know, where and when and how can these things be implemented? And that's what we'll work on together um, over the next, as I said, two to four years or so. Um, Dr. Cog will develop tracking mechanisms with local jurisdictions for required annual reporting to the Transportation Commission. As we've gone through this mitigation action plan work, it's become clear that that's going to be needed and that's something that we're going to take the lead on, uh, working with all of you to figure out um, you know, in, if and when the board adopts a mitigation action plan, how do we work together to kind of track this stuff um, over time together as a region. Um, and as I've already said, we'll adjust the mitigation measures and the mitigation action plan over time based on the region's implementation progress. 
Um, this is an updated version of a table that we have talked about at many TAC meetings, but just wanted to show you these numbers are still being refined ever so slightly, um, but I think we're getting pretty close to the final set of numbers here. Um, so just as a reminder, um, the top row, the GHG baseline plan model, um, remember the GHG rule defines the baseline in the rule as our 2050 RTP as it was adopted in April of 2021 and as it was modeled for adoption at that time. So the first rule is the emissions, the GHG emissions associated with our baseline plan. Second row is the work that we've been doing in terms of all the strategies, everything I showed you in the graphic, the technical analysis in terms of uh, emission reduction strategies. Um, the modeled reduction from the baseline shows kind of that relationship once you establish the baseline and we test these strategies, what difference are they starting to make? Um, so you can see the reduction levels coming down. Um, we've also talked a little bit about programmatic investment, both representing the programmatic investment that's already in the plan, but wasn't originally modeled because we hadn't typically done that in our traffic model, but also additional programmatic investment. And we talked about this at the last TAC meeting. Part of the changes in the plan that we're trying to affect in this process is to actually free up or reallocate additional fiscal constraint within the RTP's financial plan that we can invest more in programmatic, which are the non-project specific um, sort of investments in the plan, that we can do more of those and we can do them sooner um, to capture their GHG benefits as well. Um, so this is still draft where we're finding it, but wanted to recognize a row for additional programmatic investment in the plan. And then the total GHG reductions from the baseline sort of brings all of that together. And then you compare that with the reduction levels, the requirements, reduction requirement that are specified for us in the rule by analysis here. Um, so that's the second from the bottom. And I should have mentioned, these are all in million metric tons um, for each analysis here. So that's why you're seeing a lot of decimal points here. And then, so once you, you know, once we look at the, um, the progress that we're able to make, the reduction level requirements, then we compare those in the last row and we show the remaining gap. Um, so the good news is that based on the work that we've done, we think we can meet the reduction levels for 2025. But for the other analysis here, as we are showing um, kind of that gap that we are intending to fill through um, the measures in the mitigation action plan. So again, you've seen this before, but just wanted to orient you once more on kind of the requirements of the rule um, and the results of our technical analysis to date. Speaking of mitigation measures, again, you've seen an earlier version of this. Um, this is a list of the proposed mitigation measures that we've developed. Um, again, as a reminder here, we're looking at a couple, well, several considerations, but a couple in particular is that um, we're looking at CDOT's policy directive 1610, known as PD 1610. This is what CDOT adopted uh, a couple months ago that actually lists the available mitigation measures and in PD 1610 has a pretty complex sort of scoring um, and calculation mechanism for how you score these particular measures and ultimately the reduction levels associated with a particular measure. So we're using PD1610 methodology to sort of, um, you know, calculate these, score these, and estimate reduction levels for each, each specific measure that we're showing. Um, again, the other context here as a reminder is that um, in our work at Dr. Cog, we've been able to incorporate a lot of the PD1610 mitigation measures directly either in our focused travel demand model, otherwise in our technical analysis, things that flow from the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. We've actually been able to use a lot of those measures directly in our modeling and technical analysis work. So when we're looking for specific mitigation measures for a proposed mitigation action plan, we're looking at kind of what's left over in a sense not really what's left over, but what's sort of separate either from our 2050 plan or from our modeling or technical analysis capabilities. So we're looking at sort of policy oriented measures as we've talked about land use, redevelopment, uh, development around transit stations, parking policy, complete streets standards, you know, those sorts of policy oriented things is the universe that we're looking at is that additional layer of strategies that we can use potentially in this region to help meet the reduction levels. Um, so again, these are the strategies that are listed here, um, the reduction levels associated with them by analysis here. A um, new piece of information for you is that as we've been putting together the proposed mitigation action plan, there are several requirements in PD 1610 of what we need to include in the mitigation action plan and the level of detail that we show for each of the proposed measures to be included in that plan. So this is an example. This is um, development around um, transit oriented development, development around a transit station um, is one of the proposed mitigation measures. This is an example of what it would look like within uh, the mitigation action plan. We have sort of these profiles for each of the mitigation measures. So think of this a little bit as a cut sheet. 
um, so to speak, a profile of, of one of the measures. Not intending to do math here in open meeting, but certainly happy to answer questions when we get there. But really just the point is to show the level of detail, um, the types of calculations, the things that are required from PD1610 associated uh, with each of the measures. And it gets back to the earlier conversation around geography that once again, we're sort of estimating where in the region could this measure potentially even apply, which again, from a geography perspective is a fractional sort of proportion of the region. And then even in that conceptual geography where such a measure might apply, then we also did calculations to say, well, where is it reasonable even within the geography that it might apply? For example, on this one on transit oriented development, we know first of all, there's been a lot of TOD um, in the region. We know that there's a lot of entitlements already. We know that you know, there's open space or preserved land or other things. And so we're trying to sort of account for that, um, again, with the data and the time constraints that we had to make a reasonable sort of fractions of fractions of geography that we could reasonably estimate, you know, what is the level of implementation of, of applicability of any of these particular mitigation measures? And again, sort of a reasonable estimate of uh, reduction levels associated with them, again, based on the PD1610 methodology. Um, finally, we also want to talk about sort of the next steps. As I said, we are actually getting near the end of the technical work. So I want to talk about the adoption process um, at our board meeting on July 20th. Um, last week, our board chair did announce our public hearing for September 7th. Um, at the August 3rd board work session um, next week, that'll be kind of our final chance to have a briefing with our board, um, letting them know, sort of giving them a sense of what's coming, um, the greenhouse gas transportation report, the mitigation action plan, um, talking to them about those things um, before we release everything to start our 30 day public comment period. Um, our public comment period will actually start on Sunday, August 7th, which is the day we publish our legal notice in the Denver Post. Our public comment period will run really through September 6th, which will be a 31 day um, public comment period. We also have requirements in the greenhouse gas planning rule um, to submit the greenhouse gas transportation report and the mitigation action plan to the transportation commission within 30 days of our board's adoption of those documents. So we will submit those in early August to the transportation commission for their review. And then um, we'll actually end our public comment period action on September 6th, so we can have a full day. Um, and then September 7th, we'll have the public hearing uh, in front of our board. Um, there's the public hearing. <clears throat> and then um, on September 14th, 15th, when the Transportation Commission meets, uh, we'll be presenting to the Transportation Commission. We also have a requirement in the rule to present our sort of technical assumptions to the Air Pollution Control Division of CDPHE. We'll be presenting that to them in early August. They need to have that 45 days uh, within our board adoption. And then uh, September 19th, TAC will meet. Um, to hopefully recommend adoption of the revised 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, along with the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report and the Mitigation Action Plan. Our Regional Transportation Committee will take action or recommend action the next day on September 20th. And then on September 21st, the Dr. Cog Board uh, will hopefully take action to approve um, those documents, um, and that will meet our October 1st deadline as specified in the GHG rule. So, Mr. Chair, that's all I have today. I know that's a lot, but wanted to give that overview, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. I'll ask the, uh, the committee if there's any questions out there. I see Alex Hydright has his hand up. Why don't you go ahead, Alex? Uh, Jacob, thanks for the um, Just had a couple cool questions. And wanted to clarify, I think, a couple things that I heard you say. Um, one minor detail question on page six of your slide deck um, there's a couple mitigation measures that say reduce or eliminate minimum requirements. Are we missing the word parking from a few of those? Because we don't actually say the word parking anywhere on this slide. Um, and I believe that those ones that start with reduce or eliminate minimum requirements are actually talking about reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements. Yep, that's correct, Alex. Thanks for catching that. We, um, I meant to highlight that. So thanks for reminding me we caught that after this went out because it's it's a screenshot of the table. But yes, those are referring to uh, parking requirements and parking policy, yes. Okay, thank you. And then um, a couple other questions. So earlier in the presentation said that doing a mitigation action plan is voluntary, but if the board adopts one, then we are imposing requirements on ourselves. So following through on it then becomes mandatory. It was, it was our choice to adopt a map, but 
following through on it once adopted becomes mandatory, correct? Um, it's a good question. I, let me start an answer and then invite Ron to help me as needed. I wouldn't characterize it that way. I do understand what you're getting at, Alex. The way I'd characterize it is that um, if we if we can't meet the reduction requirements, and again, we don't think we can completely with all the strategies that we've identified, the rule specifies that one of the tools we have is to adopt a mitigation action plan. Um, as you've heard me say today and several times, we certainly think we need to do that. Uh, we are intending to do that. We are proposing a mitigation action plan for adoption as part of our strategy to meet the reduction levels. The adoption of that plan itself of the mitigation action plan does not commit a particular jurisdiction to do a particular thing at a particular time. What it does say is it says as a region, we believe that we can do these things over time and we're going to track them annually, as I said, to see how we're doing, um, to see if these things actually are viable and are helping us to meet the reduction levels. As we get into annual reporting, as I said, over two to four years, maybe we find that you know, our strategies aren't quite right. Maybe there's there's something that we had that the jurisdictions are doing more of or less of or something else, you know, we identify something else that seems even more applicable or whatever the case may be, we have, we have the ability to adjust. But adopting the plan itself does not, uh, does not uh, direct or require a particular jurisdiction to do a particular thing. That's how I'd characterize it. Well, I understand that it doesn't uh, obligate a particular jurisdiction to do a particular thing, but adopting it does obligate our region to accomplish something in aggregate, correct? Because we can't just adopt the mitigation plan and then not follow through on it. That's not an option. True, it does, you know, so, well, certainly it mandates, it, it requires mandatory annual reporting, that's for sure. Um, and yes, the intent is that we're adopting the mitigation action plan as a region because we think that that's part of the strategy um, to meet the reduction levels. And so, yes, it is incumbent upon us as a region to in good faith try and follow through. But the plan, I wouldn't, but again, I wouldn't characterize the details of what would be in the mitigation action plan as mandatory. They're not mandatory for a specific jurisdiction, but as a region doing some mix of those things, we are committing ourselves to that. And so while it doesn't say, you know, you Denver, you Lakewood, you Boulder have to make X change at Y location, as a region, we have to follow through on collectively the land use changes and parking parking requirement reductions, some mix of those in order to achieve what the mitigation action plan is supposed to accomplish, correct? I, th I think that's fair. And so I guess, you know, one of my questions is, we all know that zoning for increased density and reducing par parking requirements are among the easiest land use changes that local governments can bring to their public. Um, so after we adopt a mitigation action plan, wondering who's going to be leading the charge to take on these politically difficult uh, changes in order for our region to follow through on this on this plan. Yeah, well, like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jacob. Oh, sure. Like Ryan was going to pipe in. Oh well, let me let me ask Ron to pipe in then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hey, Alex. Thanks for the question. It's 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 important. It is a, an important consideration. Look, I think there's a couple of important points to keep in mind. Um, one is that, as you noted, these are these are regional metrics, and we, based on the analysis that we've done, we think they're reasonable and we think they're achievable over time. None of it has to happen immediately. Uh, doesn't all have to happen in one year. Um, based on the analysis, as we have have completed it so far, the first horizon year that we need to have uh, uh, an amount of these measures in place is by 2030. And so um, you're right. I would, I would say, I don't want to get hung up on semantics. I don't think that's, that's kind of necessary. The, and, a, and a formal adoption of a mitigation action plan by the board is, is, um, is indicating that the region collectively has a commitment to doing these things regionally in the in the aggregate to to make the progress towards the greenhouse gas reduction levels kind of closing that final gap um, your last point is a really important one and i think while we all know that specific actions um, that reflect these mitigation actions happens at the local level it's incumbent on dr cog as your regional agency to help local jurisdictions identify specific locations where there, where there are good opportunities in, in partnership with you and deciding what might make sense in, in any jurisdiction. And we'll be tracking those actions over time. It, it's, it's the responsibility, the requirement falls on Dr. Cog as the agency 
to track and report changes um, to, to CDOT um, over time. We report that annually, but there's no sort of, you have to do this much this year, this much next year. It's really about showing continual progress. And ultimately, as I said, we believe based on our analysis, there's a reasonable expectation we can implement enough of this regionally to achieve these greenhouse gas emission reduction levels using CDOT's um, methods and calculation methods in the policy directive 1610. Okay, we will move on then to Kent Mormon. So thanks for the presentation, Jacob. I was curious, um, you say it's voluntary, but will this become part of the TIP application process? Of, did you implement these? Uh, what, what measures have you implemented in the future? So I'm gonna direct really hard questions to Ron. So Ron, can you help with that one? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's, there's nothing in the draft mitigation action plan, Kent, uh, that we're tying these uh, to um, the tip cycle. And uh, so I, uh, that, that is not the intent. We don't believe that that will become necessary. I think we would rather work with local jurisdictions to support these efforts um, proactively and support local efforts to implement these changes where they make sense in local jurisdictions. Um, I think the reality is, I think we should be, uh, we, the reality is that if we get four years in to this process and we've done four annual reports and, and we're not making nearly enough progress to achieve these changes um, kind of in the areas that uh, kind of on, on the scale that's been identified, then, we'll, then we may need to come back and have a conversation about, are, you know, are there, other, are there other things we need to be doing? As Jacob said, are there different strategies? Or are there different things we need to do as a region to say we're kind of redouble our efforts to achieve these things? So that's a that's a future conversation, um, but there's there's no intent, and in our and our draft proposed mitigation action plan does not um, make that linkage. Then uh, second question: and, um, Were these targets? as far as targets or were these hard numbers we had to meet? And the reason I ask is 0.1 or whatever seems, or 0.01, whatever it is, seems like it's um, very close to meeting the target. And I just was wondering, is, is this a hard target or is this just a, a target versus a, a hard target as far as the numbers to meet? Yeah, Ken, let me bring up the table again, just to, um, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Give me just a second here. Okay, so I want to be clear about a couple of things related to the targets. The reduction levels, so where it says reduction requirement from the GHG rule table one, those are, so to speak, hard targets that were specified to us. They're in the rule. These come directly from the adopted rule. The remaining gap, Kent, and what you're asking about, like the 0.01 for 2050, again, these numbers might change very slightly, but I think we're pretty close to final. And the point here is that illustrating that when we've done all of the things that we've been talking about um, the last six months, all the different strategies from that graphic I showed you, you know, we do make meaningful progress. And particularly for 2025, as I said, I think you know, it looks like we can meet the reduction levels um, that are specified in the rule. But for the remaining analysis here is we do have a gap. Um, whether it's say 0.09 for 2030 or 0.08, you know, we're pretty close there. The point is that um, there is a gap that we'll need to meet. Um, and so that gap is a calculated gap, but it's, it's a gap that we need to meet through um, the mitigation action plan and mitigation measures as kind of the last step. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it just seems like you're awful close there. And I just was wondering if it was a hard get in the vicinity or if it was hard you had to meet it or exceed it. Thank you. We, we are close on 2050, but we think the most sort of transparent and conservative thing to do is to still apply uh, the mitigation action plan to, to the 2050 analysis year as well. Thank you. Can't, I'll just chime in. This is Ron. It's not horseshoes. It's not close is good enough, right? Um, it, it, it is a pass-fail test according to the rule. Yeah. Thank you. All right, you're up next. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. So uh, last Thursday, CDOT rules um, sent out um, emergency rulemaking um, on this topic. And um, 
was reviewing some of that, um, specifically two questions, uh, see if there's any clarity from uh, Dr. Cog on, um, there's a timing and determining compliance, 8.02.5.1, and it talks about uh, restricting um, MMOF. Uh, so my first question is related, will we need to restrict calls three and four to all MMOF funding? That's my first question. Um, I can pause and see if there's a response and then go to my second question. Well, our, let me start a response there. So um, in, in our understanding, and Ron can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the emergency rulemaking was sort of a technical clarification around the restriction of funds. It's not a substantive change. Um, it, specifically, it specifically notes multimodal option funds, but we, we believe that was always part of the universe of potential funds, types of funds to be restricted if we didn't meet the reduction levels. So functionally, we believe the rule hasn't changed. To your larger question around restricting tip calls three and four, and we talked about this, I think one TAC meeting ago, and admittedly it's a complex topic, but I think the bottom line is that we are, and we have always as staff been trying to find a way to get us there so that the 2050 RTP meets the reduction levels. Um, we believe with the strategies that we have outlined, including the mitigation action plan, we will be able to do that. Assuming that we are able to meet the reduction levels for each of the analysis years, there will not be a restriction on funds when it comes time for tip calls three and four. That was a great response. So essentially, the changing is just clarifying um, what the restriction will be, um, but it doesn't look like you're going to be doing that for call three or four at this time. Ron, have I stated all that correctly? Yeah, that's correct, Art. I mean, ass assuming yeah. assuming our analysis holds, assuming the board adopts the plan as, as recommended in our analysis and, and includes a mitigation action plan as part of that adoption that we believe we're demonstrating compliance with the rule and therefore uh, the restriction on funds component of the rule would not kick in and we would proceed with calls three and four as originally planned. So my other question was gonna probably render a similar response, but I thought I'll ask it anyway. It's on eight point. 05.2, um, they had crossed out, seek a waiver or ask a reconsideration accompanied by an opportunity to submit additional information. And I think they crossed that out because 8.05.2.1 has already said, request a waiver from uh, commission imposing restrictions on specific projects not expected to reduce greenhouse gas. So is that Again, just a clarification at this time, um, does it look like there'll be a waiver required? Um, Sorry, Nick, so um, as, if, we, if we meet, if we meet the reduction levels as outlined mm -hmm. in the rule, then there would, there would be no requirement for any waivers. And so I think Kent brought up just a little bit ago we were close and then you just stated, Ron, that it's a pass fail. So um, we obviously need to close those gaps that um, Jacob just went over um, in the table, those call them this, the last line that had those small differences. Is that clear? And is that the intent? So to, to, so those, the remaining gap figure in the table, in the first table, mm -hmm. that one. Um, yep. I, I think if you if you look at those, <clears throat> they look like small fractions, and it seems small. When metric, you're looking million at, metric tons. <laughs> that, yeah, those are those are million metric tons. So that's still pretty big numbers, right? That's that's um, nine. That's ninety thousand tons in 2030, and um, that's a difficult gap to close. But with the mitigation action plan that's being developed and and proposed as we've conceived it so far, that closes that gap. So that closes that remaining piece. So this figure is prior to mitigation action plan. That's based on everything else we can do from a transportation planning standpoint. Um, and then this remaining gap gets closed through the proposed mitigation action plan, which is the final. And then, then if the commission agrees, and we think they should, because um, our analysis is pretty solid, 
um, then we have complied with the rules requirements and therefore there's no funding restriction that kicks in. The only thing that kicks in is then we are reporting annually on progress towards the mitigation actions in the mitigation action plan. And because there's no restriction on funds, there would be no waiver request, no waiver required to, to implement any specific project in the plan. Does that help? Thank, thanks. And the table one is just part of the statewide puzzle. This uh, table just pertains to our MPO, correct? That's correct, Art. So targets, the reduction levels in the rule were customized for each kind of region of the state for which the rule applies. So the five MPOs in the state, including Dr. Cog and CDOT, for the non-MPO rural areas of the state. So this table is for the Dr. Cog MPO area. Thanks very much for uh, those responses. All right, next, Justin Begley. Hi, uh, Justin Begley, Denver. Um, quick question. So what we're looking at in front of us is very data heavy, numeric driven. The, the way you describe the, the monitoring of the mitigation plan and annual reports, and based on the fact that some of the mitigation strategies, many of them are very policy oriented, how, I mean, this isn't gonna be tracked the way, let's say the Metrovision numbers are tracked with, here's a number that's our target, here's where we came, we missed it, we exceeded. How are we going to take those very policy-oriented practices in the plan and, and show how they move a number? Just curious yeah. about that. No, that's a good question. I, I think the sort of short answer is that for some things, we do have data sets. We do have ability to track some of this, but um, we recognize that um, for the full universe of mit proposed mitigation action plan measures, we will need to develop some tracking mechanisms. We will need to work closely with um, all the jurisdictions in the region to sort of get a handle on some of the things for which we don't already have data or don't already have information. So that is a big takeaway for us. We actually note that in the mitigation action plan. The other thing I'd mentioned too as well when it comes to sort of that tracking mechanism, it's not just, although as important as it is to sort of set up those tracking mechanisms, which we will lead um, in cooperation with the jurisdiction that will be part of our job. But part of our job as well is that we've already had some jurisdictions come to us and say, you know, help us understand you know, we're interested in this stuff, help us understand for our jurisdiction, how we can apply some of these mitigation measures. So part of this too, is our offer to work with the jurisdictions to say, and let me come to, to that slide on any of these mitigation measures, you know, for a particular jurisdiction, you know, where could these actually apply to what level could they apply? So part of, I think our, our takeaway too, is not just helping on the tracking or leading the tracking, I should say, but actually helping jurisdictions customized resource, you know, help to jurisdictions to help figure out um, for your jurisdiction where these things could apply and when. Thank you. All right, it's muted. Uh, Brian Weimer, you're up next. All right, thanks, Jacob. Um, so my- I think you just muted yourself. The host muted me. Oh, I guess they don't want me to say anything. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, um, so my question is um, kind of following up with Justin, you know, when we start determining success on this empirical data of a mitigation action plan, is, is one entity, hey, we're moving the dial as you know, do you need four entities? I mean, that I think that's where it's kind of squishy as terms of what determines success or that we're meeting what the intent of the plan is. Yeah, um, good question. Let me try and answer it this way. I'm going to draw a parallel to our MetroVision plan and the local and regional actions for implementation within MetroVision. Same concept. They're voluntary. They're illustrative. They apply differently throughout the region. They mean different things in each of your jurisdictions. Each of your jurisdictions are differently situated. Something that Denver could do might be very different than something a smaller suburb could do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the point there is that we're not 
we don't want to sort of overcalculate or overthink this in the sense of like, we're not going to set targets for jurisdictions. We're not going to say like Denver has to do one seventh of, of all of this in order to make it work across the entire region. That, that's not the intent. Um, as you've heard me say um, ad nauseum, this is a regional level analysis. What we want to do is work with interested jurisdictions, um, both to help understand how these could apply, as I said, as well as the tracking of them. And then let's start seeing how we're doing. Um, and course correct as needed. And not just course correct as needed based on the annual reporting, although that's very important. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, as Ron said, you know, 2030 is the first year um, that these mitigation measures would apply to. So we've got some time. And during the next eight years, we'll also be updating the regional transportation plan at least once, if not maybe what, twice. Um, so we, you know, as I said, transportation planning is a snapshot in time. We will have multiple opportunities in multiple ways to kind of come back and sort of reassess all of this and say, you know, are there different things that we can be doing, whether it's mitigation measures or other content within the plan? So we've got some flexibility on how we get there. I think the point of the rule is that, you know, the intent is that we are as a region saying that we want to get there. Here are some ways that we think we can do that together. I see Ron with his hand up. So maybe Ron wants to supplement that. Yeah, just just a just a little bit, Brian. Um, so I might refer you all to attachment one in the packet that um, kind of goes in a little bit more detail than this summary table, which is the summary of the calculation of calculated greenhouse gas emission reductions by implementing um, certain things. Attachment one sort of goes through the calculation method for one of the mitigation action measures related to um, mixed use transfer and development. And so the, the, point, the point here is the measure is the amount of acres that are rezoned to these minimum um, standards. Um, we think there are places around the region that might be able to exceed these minimum standards. So we'll include that in the tracking. So the, the measure, the thing we'll be reporting on is the number of acres that have been rezoned. And again, based on our analysis, we think there's a high likelihood of um, opportunity around the region in a variety of jurisdictions and a variety of places where they could make sense uh, just to help substantiate the calculations. Um, there's probably even more true opportunity and none of these are restricted to certain um, areas or certain specific ge um, geographies. That was just how we did our sort of opportunity um, analysis. So Brian, I think the, the answer to your question is, the measure in, in these cases is sort of is number of acres. That's what we'll be tracking is the number of acres that are rezoned. And to the extent that some jurisdictions might actually be able to rezone some land to do more than the minimums, I think we'll factor that into our, into our analysis and our annual reporting. Um, but that's what we're gonna be tracking is, is sort of the acres that are rezoned. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does. Let me follow up on that since you have your slide up there and, you know, the, the network changes that you showed in the 2050 RTP are um, maybe limited given the amount of opportunity that you had um, in terms of number of projects and that sort of thing or where they're located. Did you look at, could you maybe meet this remaining gap by additional network changes um, than what you had proposed before in our previous meetings? No. And the reason? There's there's just there there there's only so many there's only so many projects and there's only there's only so many sort of other additional sort of um, multimodal projects that you can do. And if you diverted all of that money, there's just one you can't, you can't do that many sort of bike pad, kind of bike facilities, bike lanes, bike paths, multimodal paths, uh, bike pedestrian paths across the region to achieve enough greenhouse gas emission reductions to close that final gap. Okay, okay. next up is Kent Mormon. Kim Mormon, um, this, um, Jacob, this question on the table, um, that showed the, the remaining gap. Um, and I don't know if it's possible not, or not, but with the, with the, can you have another line that says with the uh, mitigation plan in place, how we would meet it? Um, in other words, is there another number that shows that or, or is this such a general plan that you're just hoping to get to zero uh, on the gap? 
um, you, from a region-wide standpoint. I don't know if there's a way to, to, to quantify these improvements or how much it gets back to, I guess, how much of which thing happens, but maybe, maybe with the mitigation, um, you know, in plan, here's what would happen. Yeah, thanks for that question, question. Ken. In fact, our final um, sort of version of this table that we'll publish in the GHG transportation report does exactly what you said, Ken. It will show kind of with the mitigation action plan, all the other strategies, where do we end up um, in terms of being able to meet the reduction levels. Um, the purpose of this table as much as anything was just to sort of show that midpoint or, or sort of that point of where, you know, we've done all the strategies, we've done everything we could, we still have a gap um, to illustrate the need for the mitigation action plan. But in kind of our final materials of publishing, we'll put that together as well and say, okay, when we do all those things, plus the mitigation action plan, we can demonstrate that we meet the emission reduction levels for each analysis here. Thank you. Okay, okay Matt Callison, you're up. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, Jacob, what is the state of our other four MPOs and then the transportation planning regions throughout the state in terms of meeting their uh, assigned reduction um, quantities at yeah. this point? Let me start an answer and then invite my colleagues to sort of chip in. Um, the first sort of tranche of the application of this rule is to Dr. Cog, the North Front Range MPO up in Fort Collins and Greeley, and then CDOT uh, for the non-rural areas. In general terms, I would say all three entities have had a somewhat similar experience, meaningful, meaningful strategies, they make a difference, struggling to meet the targets. Um, at least us, and I believe CDOT needed mitigation action plan um, but it, it's taken some thoughtful, again, as you've heard me say, it's not just two or three or five things, it's 10 or 15 or 20 things. I think that's been the shared experience of uh, the other two as well. Um, maybe Robert, if you're here, if you wanna, if you wanna um, amplify that or add to that. No, I think that's right. I th I'll add that, you know, we've, because North Front Range, Dr. Cog and CDOT have been the ones um, kind of learning how to do this as, as we try to comply with it. We've been meeting on a weekly basis for months now, coordinating, making sure we're kind of using similar methodologies, making sure that our um, modeling and everything is realistic and feasible and all that. So um, yeah, again, everybody has kind of their own unique set of circumstances and challenges and everyone's um, using a bunch of different methodologies to, to achieve the rule. But as far as I know, everyone is, is finding a path to do so. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Steve Cook. The only other, other quick thing I would um, mention there too, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but um, for this, I don't know, this cycle of GHG analysis, um, CDOT is actually covering the entire state outside of Dr. Cog and the North Front Range. So not just the rural, but basically everywhere outside of Dr. Cog and North Front Range MPO. Um, other MPOs will be added in, in sub subsequent years, I forget the exact years, when they have to actually comply, comply you know, as an individual geographic entity. Um, but right now, it's basically, in essence, three entities for this cycle, Dr. Cog, North Front Range, and then CDOT for the rest of the state. I, I don't think CDOT is calculating for the other MPOs. I think they're just counting, calculating for outside the, of the MPO areas. I think the reason the other MPOs were not um, required to comply this cycle or within the next few years is they are not currently non-attainment areas and really need to beef up their technical abilities. Um, so that they can eventually comply with the rule, like their next plan cycle updates. Hey, do we have any other questions or comments about this item? Seeing none, we'll move on then to our next informational briefing, item six on your agenda, Santa Fe Drive Planning and Environmental Linkages Study Up update of Steve Cook. Here, take this one. Okay. Thank you. That was good, good segue timing um, for, the, for this one. 
And uh, I'm Steve Cook, uh, Mobility Analytics and Operations Manager here at Dr. Cog. And periodically, um, we provide updates to the TAC on certain key uh, studies that are going on around the region. And so that's why we wanted to give you a uh, progress report on one that's uh, coming to the tail end and has a specific action plan that's already been derived. And that's for the Santa Fe uh, PEL or planning and, planning and Environmental Linkages Study. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, I believe uh, Jacob uh, Southern and possibly Steve Sherman will be giving this presentation to you. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, I assume everyone can hear me, can see me, and can see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm Jacob Southerd. I work here at CDOT Central Engineering. I'm the PM for the Santa Fe PEL, and we are just wrapping up that study and what you'll be seeing coming out of that study is what we're going to call is the Santa Fe Drive Action Plan. And what that document is, is hundreds of pages of, of improvements we can make to Santa Fe Drive um, that will be made out to the public here at the end of August to early September. And I really encourage everyone to dive into that document, kind of see all the great ideas we've come up with and all the investigation we've done into the existing condition out there. Um, since the PEL and action plan is such an, a huge, you know, encompassing document. What I'm really going to focus on today are our early action projects and kind of what everyone can expect to see coming out of this action plan within the next couple of years. Um, at that point, I'll open it up to the group um, for questions and feel free to ask me anything regarding the action plan. But for my presentation, I will be uh, focusing on our early action items. So what was the project? So for my project overview, we looked at Santa Fe Drive um, between C-470 and the junction of Alameda Avenue and I-25. So that's an 11 mile stretch of Santa Fe Drive. And the, the typical section of the corridor as we go through our project um, area changes greatly from you know more or less rural up to urban up on the north end of the corridor. And so what really what we're presented with is a corridor that has varying conditions and varying needs depending on where you are at on that corridor. And so that's why we decided to kick off a PEL study to start to formulate ideas and improvements we can make to the Santa Fe Drive between Alameda and C-470. And so what the action plan will do is identify transportation issues, community concerns and environmental concerns along the corridor, and then additionally develop short and long-term alternatives that create a clear vision for the transportation function of the corridor going into the future. And I do really think it's important just to quickly go over our purpose and need for the document. And I'm just gonna state it outright. The purpose of the recommend transportation improvements from this study is to improve safety for all users improve operational performance and enhance multimodal connectivity for the Santa Fe Drive corridor from C-470 to I-25. I do wanna give a quick shout out to all the local agencies that were partners with us throughout the entire process. Um, they were in the room with us you know, during the design decisions. I talked to a lot of um, elected officials in each of these agencies. So this document would not be possible without uh, these six agencies showing up here on the presentation. And so I do just want to thank all of them for their amazing support and um, working with us through the entire process. Um, just to give a quick overview of, of kind of how we tackled this PEL study. And so first of all, we had a project management team, which was project level staff from those local agencies I um, had on that previous slide, along with Dr. Cog, FHWA and RTD. This group met monthly, and this is really where those improvement ideas come from was this PMT. We also had an executive oversight committee, which included more of um, high level staff and elected officials from all those agencies. We met with these folks about every three months. And this was just to kind of give those um, elected officials and executives an overview of where we're at um, and get their buy off on our process as we move through each step. And then additionally, we had a pretty robust public engagement through this entire study. Um, we had a, a website open to the public the entire time in which um, citizens could provide comments. 
We also sent out a digital public survey to the residents along the corridor. Um, they were able to provide comment through that. And then since this was during COVID, we didn't have the more traditional open houses, but we did have two online public events that showed the public the process and along with um, our recommended improvements to the corridor. And so this gave the public another opportunity to give us comments, suggestions, or, or, or things that they thought could be done better. So what's gonna come out of this action plan are three types of different recommendations. Um, the recommendations I'm gonna be talking about most about today are the early action projects. And these are projects that can be accomplished with a reasonable, excuse me, reasonable budget and can be implemented within two to five years. Um, so these are really the near term solutions and, and really what they are low, low dollar improvements that we can make to the corridor so the public can see immediate improvement to Santa Fe coming out of this action plan. And out of these early action projects, we had five multimodal recommendations and four safety recommendations. Now the, the meat of the report are gonna be in these project recommendations. And these are projects that improve safety operations and multimodal connectivity and can be implemented within a 10 year time frame. Um, out of these, we had 22 multimodal recommendations and 20 roadway recommendations. Um, the report will also go into future actions. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on future actions since a PEL study is so high level. And since we uh, define future actions as projects that would take longer than 10 years to implement, um, so a lot can change within that 10 year time frame. But really what these future actions does is identifies areas along the corridor where we expect to have the most problems um, going into that 10 year plus time frame. So um, first I wanna talk about the early action projects that are already funded. And so about two thirds of the way through this uh, PEL study, we started to identify these early action projects and immediately CDOT wanted to demonstrate to the public that um, this isn't just gonna be a study that we are going to make some improvements to the corridor. And so using faster safety dollars, we were able to fund four early action projects, um, which I'll show you now. The first two of which are the Hampton Avenue and Oxford Avenue sidewalk um, connections. And so what we do see along this corridor are numerous locations where there are gaps in sidewalks and even locations where we have bus stops with no sidewalk or no, no pedestrian infrastructure to get folks to those bus stops. Um, so these are two locations. Up here on the left, you can see the Hampton Avenue sidewalk improvement and um, right now there is a goat path kind of coming down from South Platte River Trail to get across Santa Fe and, and to the other side of Hamden to the east side. And so folks are walking this without any pedestrian infrastructure. Um, what I have shown up here is just scoping level. Um, so definitely more detail to come as we kick off design and, and start to collect survey and all that stuff. But really what we wanna do is provide that connection for pedestrians from South Platte River Drive um, across Santa Fe and over to the east side of Hampton. Additionally, we did identify a sidewalk missing connection at Oxford Avenue. On the west side there, there's an existing bus stop and there's no sidewalk leading to that bus stop. So we're gonna provide that connection and then also provide enhanced um, treatment at that free right-hand turn lane to make that a safer condition for pedestrians. Another early action project um, would support a project that Littleton um, is has completed and will complete in the future. And so right now on the west side of Santa Fe on, on Prince Street, there are bike lanes on the east side, um, Little Tin plans on building bike lanes in the future. And so what this project would do is, is to connect those bike lanes across Santa Fe. Additionally, we've seen a lot of accidents happening on that northbound left turn lane on Santa Fe on a Prince Street. A lot of folks are confusing that lane with a through lane or the HOV lane. So providing better delineation and better striping um, for that movement we believe would reduce accidents in this area. And so this project is meant to provide a uh, bike connection across Santa Fe, and Santa Fe and then additionally through restriping improve um, the safety condition of this intersection. Another early action project is the conversion of Crestline Avenue to ride in and ride out. And so another high accident area we're seeing are, are folks going southbound on Santa Fe and making that left turn 
on the Crestline Avenue. We're seeing a lot of T-bone accidents in this area. And since folks can access all the housing and, and build it and excuse me, businesses along Crest, Crestline, just 900 feet to the north from Prince, um, this movement is redundant. And so by installing a raised median here and prohibiting that southbound left turn movement, we are going to reduce crashes and improve the safety along the stretch of Santa Fe. So we do also have a, a list of early action projects that are unfunded. Um, CDOT is currently you know, looking for funding for these if it becomes available. Um, but these are again, a great five projects that we could implement within the next couple of years to make improvements to Santa Fe. Um, the first of which is just installing wayfinding signs. And so what we found through the study is along the corridor, we have a bunch of great bike and pet facilities. We have the Mary Carter Greenway, Greenway Trail and various other trails going east and west connecting to the Mary Carter Greenway Trail. What we found is, is we just need to implement more wayfinding signs and, and better ways for folks to navigate these trails and make these connections. And so this is an area where we identified um, improvements to the wayfinding from Little Dry Creek Trail to the Mary Carter Greenway Trail. And this would just help folks use that Mary Carter Greenway Trail to go north and south, and then also be able to identify where they are relative to Santa Fe, so they can turn off that trail and, and go to wherever they may be going along the corridor. An additional um, early action project is a northbound auxiliary lane through Dartmouth. And so really what we have seen in multiple locations along the corridor is the dropping of the acceleration lanes and then just a few, you know, a little bit up the, the corridor, we have an acceleration lane. And if we can connect these acceleration deceleration lanes, especially through intersections here at Dartmouth, we should be able to drastically reduce um, incidents in these areas. And so really what's happening are folks are accelerating to get on Santa Fe and there's a light, you know, that light may have just turned red. And so they have to merge on over as folks are stopping for that red light and it's causing a lot of side swipe and rear end accidents. So if we can help connect these acceleration deceleration lanes, we should give folks an appropriate space and a safe space to make those um, weaving maneuvers. This project um, is ex exclusively bike and pet related and we at CDOT have identified a small amount of design funds to start to look at this. Um, so what this is, is the Mary Carter Greenway Trail under US 80, 285. And the Mary Carter Greenway Trail is an excellent two-way bike facility up and down the entire trail. This is the choke point for the trail. So right where it goes under US 285 here, the trail width becomes about four feet. And so, you know, not enough area for two bikes to pass each other or a bike to pass a pedestrian in this area. So it really is the choke point for the Mary Carter Greenway Trail. And so we have identified some design funds here at CDOT just to identify a preferred solution here, looking at the as-built of that bridge and a few other things to see what options we have to widen the trail here. And so the cost is still unknown, but another great improvement we can make to an already great bike and ped facility. Um, finally, uh, we have the northbound auxiliary lanes from Vinewood to Bulls, and this is another great example of what I was talking about earlier of just having acceleration and deceleration lanes, a lot of merging, weaving, all while trying to navigate a um, corridor with street lights. And so here between Vinewood and Bulls, it's only a half mile, but we have the acceleration lane coming up from Vinewood, deceleration deceleration lane to church and, you know, repeat that from church to bowls. And so if we can connect those A cell and D cell lanes through this corridor, we should be able to provide um, greater distance for those merges to happen and a safer space for those merges to happen. And um, this wouldn't require any widening. It would just be a, a fact of restriping and then uh, looking at some of those island medians and some of the intersections. Another um, bike pet facility improvement would be uh, the Littleton to Downtown Trail um, to State, excuse me, Littleton um, to the Maricar Greenway to Littleton LRT Station Connection Trail. And that trail goes through Little's Dry Creek Trail. Um, 
so again, using wayfinding signs to help folks navigate along an already great trail network. And then um, this would have to go through Littleton, but um, improving the crossings at the local streets in downtown Littleton. So improving those crossing treatments so it is a safer condition for bikes and peds. And then this should more easily allow folks to get from the Mary Carter Rumory Trail to the LRT network. And so really what the action plan does is it provides a framework for what we want to see on Santa Fe. And since all those local agencies I mentioned have supported the action plan, it really sets us up for funding in the future for, you know, a multitude of projects in the action plan. And we've already seen that come to play in the last Dr. Tip application. Um, there was an application made by Arapahoe County with support of the local jurisdictions in Arapahoe County that are along the Santa Fe Drive corridor and they did apply for five bike and pet improvements um, you can see them up here on the screen only one of those was awarded but still you know a great success as we're going to see bike and pet improvement um, now has design funds now has construction funds should be implemented here within the next few years so the public can start seeing um, the recommendations made in the action plan um, you know put to work and built and so that improvement was the mineral station bike and pet improvements and really what this project entails is creating a bike facility and a better uh, pet facility along around the mineral station um, so folks can more easily arrive there by foot um, by scooter by bike so that was just my brief presentation kind of our, on our early actions and what we'll be seeing on this quarter over the next couple of years um, like i mentioned within the action plan we do have recommendations for that 10 year time frame, for um, that 10 plus year time frame, and I encourage everyone to um, go find that action plan, see what's in there when we release it here at the end of August, early September. But until then, are there any other questions for me why this group has me? We'll take questions now. Anyone have any questions for Jacob? Here a minute. Does not look like we've got any questions for you, Jacob. All right, awesome. Thank well, if any questions do come up, um, we do have a project website. Just Google Santa Fe PEL. My contact information is on that website. Feel free to shoot me an email anytime. All right, thank you very much, Jacob. All right, thanks, everybody. All right, well, we'll move on then in the agenda to item number seven, which is member comment and other matters. We'll start with, an, uh, is there any updates on the AMP working group? There is not, Mr. Chair. We canceled our meeting because it fell on July the 5th this month. Okay. Are there any other comments from members? I am not seeing any hands. So we will uh, end that uh, item. Uh, the next meeting we have uh, for the TAC is going to be Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Uh, so with that, we will adjourn this meeting and I wish you a good month. Thanks everyone, have a good day. Thank you, all is well.